Let me have you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 10 for our text this morning. Acts 3, verses 1 through 10. Let me start there. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had been done, excuse me, at that which had happened unto him. Amen. This text lends itself to natural outline. Think of this lame man outside the temple as a picture of, of any man, man or woman, who is still unbelieving and without Jesus Christ. And then think of Peter and John as examples to any Christian who should be able to tell someone else about Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says that God hath, quote, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ, an ambassador for God. Every true believer should remember that others need to be saved as well. Others need Jesus Christ. They should make some effort to win somebody else to a saving relationship with the Son of God. I call this sermon today, The Need of Every Man. And there are 10 lessons I want you to consider. First of all, a sinner is born helpless. It says in verse 2, a certain man lame from his mother's womb. We read, for as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Romans 5 Verse 12, you don't become a sinner when you start to sin. You start to sin because you are a sinner. King David wrote, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, verse 5. His mother wasn't committing a sin when she conceived him, but his, he meant he was a sinner from conception. The Apostle Paul confessed, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, verse 18. These bodies are described as mortal, as corruptible, as perishable in the New Testament. Something needs to be done about them. Someone who's never trusted Jesus Christ to save them is a spiritual cripple, and they don't realize it. But the sinner is born helpless. Lesson number two is this. He's outside the dwelling place of God. Verse two says he was laid daily at the gate of the temple, not inside. A lot of non-believers can admire Christianity. They may have Christian friends. They have a, a measure of respect for the gospel of Christ dying on the sake, for the sake of sinners. They may even admire you for attending your church faithfully each week. 
but don't ask them to come. They can appreciate Jesus Christ, but from a distance. They're on the outside looking in. They don't realize what the life of a Christian can be. It can be good. Amen. Our text said, verse 1, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. The Bible declares, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, verse 1. We're told, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. You can't do that unless you get together with other believers. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 25. You should want to be with the brethren more often the closer we come to the return of Jesus Christ. Not the church building, but the believers inside the church. They are the church. You find some true friends when you get saved. You really do. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, you find people who will pray for you, who care about your welfare, who want God's very best for you. And only your flesh will stand in the way of that fellowship. People you're going to know for all of eternity because Jesus Christ has brought you together. But the unsaved man or woman is on the outside looking in. He's outside the dwelling place of God. Lesson number three is this. The unbeliever is a spiritual beggar. Verse three who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. Well alms would be some charity, some handout. Give me something. Anyone caught up, caught up in another religious belief, some cult, is a spiritual beggar of sorts. You see these guys with these cardboard signs, will work for food. John Stossel had a great expose on that a few years ago. These guys have signs that say, we'll work for food. Once they were offered a job in exchange for some food. They didn't want to do the work. They had some excuse why they couldn't do the work. But they still offer you their credentials as to why you should give them money. Disabled vet, you know, homeless, please help, God bless. You know, mother, three children, homeless, and so we're living in our car, God bless. I was heading down the off-ramp with a friend of mine, and off to the side of the curb one time, there was a, a woman on the driver's side with a cardboard sign that said, out of gas, please help. And she had her friend holding a baby on the passenger side, so away from the traffic, I guess to play on sympathy. And my friend says, man, it must stink to run out of gas right there. And I said, yeah, it's a good th thing she had that cardboard sign ready to go. I said, look 100 feet down the bottom of the off ramp, there's a gas station. I never thought about that. I said, you better think about it. There's always, a, there's always someone to, out there trying to scam you. It doesn't mean they're all scammers, but there's enough of them that you, you get a little leery about opening your pocketbook to them. But the unbeliever is a spiritual beggar. And uh, without commenting on the, the social issue of you know, people on hard times, it's a great picture of people who promise to do whatever they have to do to earn their salvation. I'll go to church. I'll get baptized. I'll take the sacraments. I'll give away money. I'll donate to this thing and that thing. I've been a good church member. I was baptized when I was little. We've given a lot of money to worthy causes. I went on a missions trip with my youth department for a month last year. I was a missionary on vacation. Um, I went through some church catechism. I took some new believers class and so forth. Somehow I've done more good than other people have done. Therefore, God owes it to me. But unless you've done what God's commanded you to do, you're still unsaved. You're a spiritual beggar of sorts. Point number four, he expects something from Christians. 
Verse 5 said, He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. You know, historically, real, genuine believers in Jesus Christ have been among the most charitable people in the world. They really are. Some national survey the Los Angeles Times published several years back said that people with no faith in God, no church connection whatsoever, give an average of $200 a year in charity compared to nearly $1,500 given by people who have a real living faith in God. Even though the unchurched people tended to be slightly higher educated and made better incomes than the religious folks. Think of the hospitals that have been built uh, by different people in the name of Jesus Christ. Methodists build hospitals, Catholics build hospitals, Presbyterians build hospitals, Lutherans build hospitals, Baptists build hospitals, Seventh-day Adventists build hospitals. Now we would argue with them about a hundred different things on doctrine and so forth, but the person of Jesus Christ moves in the hearts of men to do some great thing in his name for his honor. Amen. Think of the Salvation Army. Think of the Red Cross. Right. Think of the rescue missions. Think of the thrift stores that are uh, ostensibly there to help people, minister to people's physical needs uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Not only do unbelievers expect to receive something from Christians, they have a right to expect it. If we are what we say we are, saved from the consequence of our sin and uh, delivered from a, an eternity in hell, if we have what we say we have, the Holy Spirit of God uh, living inside our bodies by the new birth, if we're going where we say we're going, to an eternal sinless city not made with hands, built by God, eternal in the heavens, then the world has a right to expect something from us. We have more than they have. We have everything they want. We have everything they need. We have everything they ought to have. We have more to offer people than simply alms, a quick handout. That man was laid at the gate. Someone had to carry him there every day so he could spend his day begging. If he got just enough to get through that day, the next day someone had to bring him again. Then the unbeliever in the world knows one thing. He knows he should be able to expect something from Christians. Lesson number five is this. He doesn't know his real need. Verse 5, expecting to receive something of them. You know, the secular world can't satisfy the needs of an unforgiven soul. It cannot. The people, the places, the parties, the music, the alcohol, the fornication, the drug use, the gambling, the new movie, so forth, those things leave a person empty after a while. And then next week they seek after it again, hoping to recharge their battery because they don't have anything that lasts. They can't offer any lasting peace when your heart is broken. Once the excitement is over, people start looking for something else to replace it with. The alms the beggar received would be enough to last him that day, and then he'd have to be carried back the next day to do it again. You know, in a spiritual way, any religious belief... Any church doctrine, any church that preaches that you, you do not know for sure if you're going to heaven, that's the sin of presumption. Only God knows this side of heaven who's actually going to make it. Nobody can say, I know for sure that I'm saved. Any church that teaches that is really offering nothing more than the drugs or the alcohol, whatever else the person is depending upon, the fornication, because once the thrill of that wears off, they have to get another dose. Once, once the excitement of, of uh, your spiritual life uh, kind of dies down because you did something wrong, you sinned something, you, something here during the week, you did something that was unpleasing and not very Christian-like, and you're afraid you lost it again, uh, you have to go back and 
repent at the altar all over again and ask God to save you again, that church is really no better than those things because they offer nothing that actually lasts. Psychology means the study of the soul. Not simply the mind or the spirit, the study of the soul. Man's greatest need is not financial or medical or mental. Man's greatest need is spiritual. Amen. Ye must be born again, yes. Jesus said. But the unsaved man doesn't know what his real need is. Lesson number six. Salvation is better than money. Peter says in verse six, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Christ spoke a parable about a rich man who had so much he didn't have room to store it. We read that in Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Christ said, For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke 12, verse 15. He asked his disciples, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, verse 26. Ultimately, what you have to offer the unbeliever is more valuable than all the money in the world. It's more valuable to them than winning the lottery. My Father in heaven owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. There's not a thing in all of known reality that will be withheld from me one day. Think of the deity that created the, the galaxies and the universe and all reality as we see it and know it. That's the one you live for. That's the one you serve. That's the one who lives inside of you by faith. Amen. Paul describes himself and us by extension as poor, yet making many rich. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10. More precious than gold, right? More, much better than silver is the price of a soul. God wants to deliver. Salvation is better than money. Um, you can lose your money, but I'm here to tell you, you can't lose your salvation. Praise God. Point number seven. Any Christian can tell someone else. Verse six. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Later in chapter four, verse 13, we read, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. God didn't establish some class system where only the minister or the preacher or the person behind the pulpit uh, talks to someone else about how to be saved, how to be born again. That's the job of every true believer. Every believer is part of the body of Jesus Christ. Every believer is part of a spiritual priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us. One Christian plants a seed by his life, by his conversation, by a gospel track, by a prayer for someone's need. Someone else comes along, they water that seed by the same things. And another person comes along, when the time is right, that person says, I need Jesus Christ too. And that that last person's fortunate to be there when it comes, it springs forth a new life. It's like this one brother Jay testified to yesterday. Somebody, somewhere along the way, had been working on that man. He had been exposed to the gospel in some way before uh, he met our people. And the time was right, he was ready to say yes to Jesus Christ. But every Christian should be able to tell someone else how to be born again. It's not that complex. It's not that difficult. It's not that complicated. Uh, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, physical things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 14, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's spiritual. 
And all these things, physical things, shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. If a child can grab a hold of the fact that he is a sinner and he wants God to forgive him too, then it's a very simple proposition. It's a very simple matter. Anybody should be able to tell someone else, listen, if you admit to God you're a sinner, don't try to cover it up and make excuses for yourself and, and beg God to forgive you. God will save you. God wants to save you. God wants to forgive you. Point number eight, let me say this. Salvation is immediate. Verse seven. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Just as you were born into the world on a certain day and at a certain time, you can be born again at a certain day on a certain time. It can occur in a moment. For sure, for certain, and forever. Amen. It doesn't require you to spend years uh, resisting certain temptations of the flesh, giving up certain things to prove that you're worthy of it. It doesn't require you to go through some new uh, confirmation class or some catechism uh, set of lesson lessons. It doesn't require you to join something or complete some new uh, church member's class to then say, I'm, I'm a true Christian. It happens just like that. As a matter of fact, it doesn't require you to do anything except trust that he's already done everything. That's what it requires. Are you smart enough and willing enough to say, everything I needed, every, everything I need to cover my guilt of sin, Jesus Christ provided when he died in my place. He suffered in my place on Mount Calvary long before I was ever born, but he was dying for the sins that I would one day commit. And on that basis, a great spiritual transaction takes place Amen. by faith. How many can remember the day and the time and the general circumstances of when you trusted Jesus Christ to save you? I'm lucky enough I can. Some of you may not. You might not have written down the date. And uh, it's too bad that whoever you prayed with didn't think ahead to write it down and give it to you and say, listen, Remember this day. Remember this date. Remember the conversation. Remember these circumstances. Because a year from now, you'll be one year old as a Christian. It'll mean something to you. And if you lead someone to Jesus Christ, make a point to do that. And, and tell them just that way. Listen, a year from now, you're going to look back and say, I've been a true believer for a year now. And think back of how your life might have changed, what God's done for you since that time. It can be a real source of blessing to you. I was born again November 5th, 1967, just about 12 o'clock noon at the end of our Sunday morning service. And as I've told you before, it's the most vivid memory of my early child. It happened uh, just as clear as if it happened two weeks ago. And it's never faded from my mind. And I hope it never does. But salvation can be immediate. Lesson number nine, a new convert must stand before he can walk. Verse 8, And he, leaping up, stood and walked. The hymn writer puts it, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And in the chorus he says, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Paul described it as this grace wherein we stand. Romans 5, verse 2. Peter calls it, this grace of God, wherein ye stand. 1 Peter 5, verse 12. A brand new Christian should understand that since Jesus died in his place, and since he has put his, uh, was punished for his sins, and since he has placed all of his hopes and trust in Jesus Christ dying for his sake, that there's no way in the world he can ever go to hell. Amen. It's already been taken care of by Jesus Christ. Now he's ready to begin a life uh, living for Jesus Christ, following him as a true disciple, one devoted, one who wants to know more about him. More about Jesus, would I know more of his grace to others? Show! Now he's ready to start learning the great doctrines and revelations that come from the word of God. 
from the Word of God. I've observed, I've noticed this, this, and it came to me a few minutes ago. People who are always worried about losing their salvation never seem to grow, grow up as a true believer at the way they should. They're always fixated on whether I lost it, whether I need to do something to get it back again. They never move on beyond that. But a new convert must stand before he can begin to walk. Stand in the fact that Jesus Christ saved you and there's not a way in the world you're going to hell. Now you live for him. Your life, you don't live for him to earn your way. You live, your, you live for him because you're on your way. Yeah. Lastly, lesson number 10. His testimony can influence others. Verses 9 and 10 in our text. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat it for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. We read in John chapter 9 about Jesus spitting on the ground, making uh, mud or clay, putting in a blind man, uh, on a blind man's eyes, and with that healed the blind man of his uh, sight problem. All the neighbors asked, Is this the same man that was blind and begging? And how were thine eyes opened? John chapter 9, verses 8 to 10. You ever, and he said, a, a man named Jesus put clay in my eyes and told me to go wash, and now I see. Who am I to argue with him? I often wondered if the Lord just, a little bit of spit, you know, a tiny little bit of mud, or if he went a, you know, got a big one. <laughs> a lot of details aren't quite given to us in the scriptures. We read about the Samaritan woman, uh, the woman at the well, John chapter 4. She ran home and told her friends, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? John 4 verse 29. She was sure of it. She was convinced of it. And she wanted to tell other people. Peter preached a great sermon about this miracle today. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 3,000. 5,000, I read that wrong. Let me close with this story about a man named Lucius A. Eddy. I always like this illustration. Lucius A. Eddy was an unsaved businessman. And when he was 75 years old, he went forward in a Billy Sunday revival, tent revival, back in the 20s. Mr. Eddy had been the president of the Merchants National Bank in Syracuse, New York. And at 75 years old, he went forward, got saved. Other businessmen who were present at the service, they shouted and cheered when they saw him walking the sawdust trail. But Mr. Eddy lived another 17 years and died at age 92. And in that 17 years, they estimate that Mr. Eddy led 1,000 men to Jesus Christ. To think that, well, God can't do anything with me. My testimony doesn't matter much. I don't know how to tell somebody else how to be saved. I don't know what to do. Think again. Little is much when God is in it. Amen. Are you thinking about the souls of others? Do you see other people as a lost soul who need Jesus Christ? Or do you just let them go by and say, well, someone else will talk to them and some other day I'll get around to it. Or You don't even want to broach the subject. You don't look for a way to say, listen, you and I don't know each other, but I go to church, I'm a Christian, and I care about people. Let me ask you, if you died tonight, do you know you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? See what happens, see what kind of conversation gets started. You gotta start somewhere. If you have a track, say, listen, I I don't think I can answer everyone's questions, but this might help you get an understanding. Let me give you this, read it. Next time I see you, we can talk about it and tell me what you think of it. See what happens on that basis. Got to start somewhere. Be mindful of the lost. Be mindful that salvation is better than gold and silver. 
that it can happen instantly and it lasts forever. That's a marvelous thing. It lasts forever. 